lives in the present. We're to look at our hope in the future, and it should affect our, our actions and our thoughts and our activities here in this life. For example, Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us that our faith as a Christian is based on, it says, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Romans 12 says that one of the marks of a true Christian is that we rejoice in hope. And that hope is hope in the future that we will be glorified and perfected on the last day. And here in the Old Testament in Psalm 16, we have really the same idea of this present faith and future hope expressed by David. It's a study in David's relationship with God, and it illustrates how how the logic of faith can lead us to the conclusion that, that our lives in the present, we can live with a, a confidence because of our future hope. And also no study of Psalm 16 would be complete unless we see somehow in the shadows David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, this morning, we're going to start by looking at this psalm in the light of what it meant to David and what it should mean to us in our relationship with God. Because as this psalm unfolds, we begin to see a picture of how David's faith dealt with his doubt and his fear. And in the end, we see him finding confidence, which leads to his hope for future joy. And it's really a template for us to achieve a, well, a genuine future hope for ourselves. So if you have your Bibles open, or your apps, or your devices, wherever you access God's Word these days, let me encourage you to open up to Psalm 16 and, and follow as I read. But uh, first, let me, let me just pray for God's help. Heavenly Father, we come to this portion of our worship where we have your Word open in our laps. So we pray now that by your Spirit you would be here to, to open our minds and our hearts. We pray that your Spirit will be here to guide us and lead us and to teach us and change us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So hear the written Word of God that he has for us this morning. A Amictam of David. <clears throat> Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy and inerrant word. Well, you know, as I was reading this, we were trying to make an outline of it. I just realized that actually... These verses make their own outline. So if you have your Bibles open, we'll, we'll just kind of work through this verse by verse to begin with. And so notice in verse 1 that David starts off with a petition. It's an invocation of the Lord. Actually, it's, it's more like a plea. Preserve me, O God, he says. Preserve him from what, though, I think? You know, at this point, we're not really sure what he is seeking preservation or protection from. So it does raise the question, what is David so worried about? And if we can, I'd just like to set that question aside for a moment. We're going to come back to it. But first I want to point out that as he calls upon the mercy of God to save him, 
The title he uses that's translated God, preserve me, O God, is Elohim, which many of you know expresses God's almighty and omnipotent power. So David cries out, preserve me, O God, of unequaled omnipotence and unequaled power. And having cried out and petitioned the Lord, he now declares four truths that show us who God is to David. Firstly, he says, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Almighty and omnipotent God, I trust you. I trust your almighty power to provide safe refuge. You see, David is saying that because I know of your unsurpassed power, because I trust you as my refuge of protection and safety, I cry out to you alone for sanctuary. In verse 2, he says, I say to the Lord. And if you look closely, you will see that that word Lord is in all capitals, which signifies the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. You see, Yahweh signifies the God of the covenant, the God who always keeps his word, who always keeps his promises. Preserve me, O Yahweh, my personal God, the one who has revealed himself to be covenantly faithful to me. You are my Lord. And again, look at the second occurrence of the word Lord in that verse, and you'll, you will see it's not in all capital letters. This time the Lord has been translated from the word Adonai, which means sovereign Lord. David is saying, you are my sovereign king. You're my boss. It's the idea of both a personal relationship and a relationship of total submission. Yahweh, you are my sovereign keeper. You are my sovereign master. You see, David is recognizing that Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Exodus, is his Lord and his master. And now, just look at what David has done in these opening few words. In the midst of his fear, the midst of his plea for protection and preservation, he has reminded himself that God is all-powerful that God is the one who owns the heavens and the earth, that God is sovereign, he's omnipotent over all things, that Yahweh is his strong one, and that Yahweh is not just strong, the transcendent God that lives somewhere up there, but he's also a personal God, and he is the personal God who delivers David. And for us, Well, those are the things that should come to mind whenever we think of God, regardless of our situation or our circumstances. That our God is almighty, that we are his, and he is the source of total safety and absolute strength. It's something that we actually need to train our minds to do during the good times, during the easy times, so that, well, we're not out of practice when the fearful times come. And it's so wonderful to think of God as personal, that he's like a father involved in your life through the person of Jesus Christ, that he knows you. He knows exactly what you're going through, exactly what you're experiencing all the time. And because he knows you, because he investigates and scrutinizes and loves you as only a heavenly father can, well, he is the one who promises to deliver you. You see, David is standing against the tide of false pictures and ideas of God by rehearsing God's attributes and repeating them back to God and to himself for the sake of his own faith. And then notice that he puts that into practice in the second half of verse 2. He says, I have no good apart from you. David is reminding himself intellectually of, of who God is, but He's also speaking to remind his heart. I mean, this is really an emotional verse. Because what this line says is, O Lord, I value you in my heart more than anything else. I set you above all things, above all possessions, all relationships, every other treasure in my world, and everything else in my life. I set you above it because none of them, as good as they may be, contain any goodness apart from you. You see, David, well, actually for David, God 
is the only good he knows in this life. And he treasures the good that he has in God. David finds nothing but poverty apart from God. The world is an empty wasteland. All David seems to find elsewhere is false faith, false hope. Because he says, without Yahweh, there is no goodness. Verse 2 expresses an absolute submission to God. However, it's not a, a slavish submission. It's a happy, it's a pleasing submission because of the goodness David finds there. This is devotion and delight, all royal lived in one. And that's what, if you think about it, that is really what the first commandment is supposed to look like, isn't it? And as David exalts in what God is for him, we find that he also delights in the people of God. Verse 3, he says, As for the saints of the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. And notice the word saints. These are the brothers and the sisters in the church, aren't they? They are the excellent ones in whom I find all my delight. I mean, have you thought of your fellow church members like that lately? The excellent ones in whom you find all your delight? I mean, if you notice that in the Bible, it never shows us a churchless Christ. You never get Jesus without his people. The Lord Jesus and his church go together. Paul in Colossians 1, verse 4, he says, We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. You see, if there is real faith in Christ Jesus, then there will be love for all the saints. If there's a, a vertical faith in Christ, then there will be this horizontal love for all the saints. I mean, they just go together. Now, we have to understand this is not some kind of naive, sentimental kind of love. I mean, we all know there are problem people among the saints. And Paul's letter to Corinthians shows that he was fully aware of those problems. But the reason he can say, I love the saints, is because he doesn't see them as they presently are. He sees them as they're going to be when they're glorified in heaven. You may know C.S. Lewis's famous sermon on heaven called The Weight of Glory. It's a well-known sermon. And in it, he makes the point that inside the church, there is no such thing as an ordinary person or a mere mortal, because one day we will all be transformed into the image of Christ. Therefore, one must always be aware that even the dullest, the most uninteresting, even the most aggressive person that you know in the church may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you might actually be tempted to worship it. Therefore, there are no ordinary people among the saints. So you and I must, albeit by faith, something we have to learn, but we must learn to delight in God's people. I mean, it's far too easy to look at one of the saints and say, well, you know, they don't seem like much of a Christian to me. I mean, look at what they've done. Look at what they do. Look how they live. I mean, they've even done some of that stuff to me. And still they call themselves a child of God. And if I'm supposed to love them, are you sure there's not some sort of malfunction in the kingdom of heaven? And yet when we look at other Christians, not as who they are presently, but as they are in Christ, and we imagine what they're going to be like in eternity. Well, that not only changes our perspective of them, it also changes our perspective of God and who God is and his relationship to us. I mean, think about what David is saying. God is the catalyst for his delight in the saints. Because David delights in those with whom he shares the same object of praise, he delights in those with whom he shares the same refuge, those with whom he shares the same sovereign king, and with those who, who treasure the same goodness of the Lord. I mean, these are like-minded people with him. They are, they are his people. They are his tribe. And notice, secondly, that as David states his love for the saints, 
he voices a rejection of the ungodly. The family of God insulates him against the ungodly, and he, he wants no part of those who seek other gods. Verse 4, he says he knows that the sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name upon my lips. Now, if there are times when you are tempted to think that fellowship of unbelievers is more attractive, maybe more fun, maybe even more encouraging than it is with believers, well, just read verse 4. Because verse 4 reminds us that those who chase false gods and deny the one true living God, in the end, they are going to reap the miseries and the sorrows of their sin, which he says multiply it's with every day that passes. David is saying, I'm so totally satisfied in God, so totally in love with him, that I look nowhere else. If another God comes along and offers me anything, I won't even speak his name. I will not even give him the honor of naming him. You see, David knew about idolatry. He'd been down to Gath. He had seen Dagon, the giant half-fish, half-man god of the Philistines. He had been to Moab and seen Chemosh, the idol of the Moabites. David knew about idolatry. And he wanted no part in that kind of thing because he says, the Lord is my chosen portion. First half of verse 5, he says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Back in verse 2, David said, I have no good apart from you. And here is much the same thought. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. As David says, Yahweh is my food and my drink. He is the one who sustains me, the one who refreshes me. I mean, this is really Old Testament spirituality, isn't it? Yahweh himself is my food and my drink. And that phrase also put me in mind this week of the Lord's Supper that, that Jesus says to us, I am your allotted portion. I am your cup. My grace is sufficient for you. The Heidelberg Catechism, which we just looked at, with another portion says, just as bread and wine nourish the temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink of the Christian soul for eternal life. In other words, even as the bread sustains your physical life and as the wine refreshes you, so I, Jesus says, your crucified and risen Lord will always sustain and refresh you. I am your allotted portion and your cup and your gra my grace is sufficient for you. And then in the second half of verse 5, David says, you hold my lot. I think this relates back to, you are my Lord. Verse 2, you are my Lord, my master. And now he adds, you hold my lot. In Proverbs 16.33, we're told that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. In other words, David is saying, you hold my lot. When the dice are rolled or the wheel is spun, however they fall, I know that what happens to me has been decided by God. I am in his hands. It is his mighty, sovereign king of the universe that actually oversees my life. My soul is in God's hands. And then in verse 6, David acknowledges how great God has been to him. He knows that God is in control, and he says, the lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance, he says. He exalts in God's control over his life. David exalts in the knowledge that God has drawn the boundaries. He's put up the fence that surrounds him so that he will never fall outside of God's refuge. You see, it's, it's not only that God gives us our faith, but it is also God who sustains our faith for us. He puts up the boundaries. And as I seek my refuge in Him, and as I recognize that He is my portion, and there is no good outside of Him, David said He works on my behalf to ensure that He remains my treasure, 
and my pleasure. You know, what we're reading here really is genuine praise and adoration and gratitude for the satisfaction that Yahweh has provided for David. You know, I wonder if we can ever offer this kind of praise enough, with enough passion, with enough soul, if you will. David says, look where God has drawn my lines. He's protected me. I have a beautiful inheritance. He's saying, I'm satisfied with what God has done in my life, and I trust him for the future. So, so far in these first six verses, we've seen David exalt Yahweh as his secure refuge, his sovereign king, his store of goodness, and his chosen portion. And he continues in verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. You know, this is really the secret to being content and satisfied with what the Lord has given you, where the Lord has put you. Because if you will open your heart to Him, He will instruct you and teach you. He will counsel you in how to be content. You know, I don't know what your sleep is like, but I seem to spend a lot of time awake at night. And one day a person said to me, maybe God is just waking you up so that you can pray. He suggested that it was God working on my heart in the stillness of the night. And I'm sure all of you are aware that the nighttime is the prime time for worry. And I will tell you now that I found this guy's advice to be invaluable over the last few years. When you're tempted to be overly worried about something or unhappy with something in your life, it's God who says, let me teach you. Let me counsel you. If you were just to open your heart to me, come and lay your burden on me. He says, I will show you how to be content. And isn't that wonderful to think that we have a counselor available 24-7, 365 days a year? He never takes holidays. He never puts you on the answer phone. He never transfers your call to the messaging service. And just think about the value and the accuracy of his counsel. The word of God straight to the heart of men and women. And God is the true counselor. He is the faultless advisor, isn't he? I mean, have you ever found something missing from the word of God? Have you ever found a mistake in the Word of God. You see, God has taught David that when he doesn't understand, when he is confused or unhappy or worried, he must look away from himself and then focus on God, on who God is. And David is able to say, God is good. And if God is good, then that means that what he gives me must also be good. And then we come to verse 8 and we find that David has broken through from fear to confidence. I mean, look at verse 1. David begins with a plea for preservation. Preserve me, O God. And it ends here in verse 8 with, I will not be shaken. What begins as an outcry for help ends with the steadfast knowledge that his refuge is safe. His sovereign master is in control. The goodness of God is his treasure. God's counsel to him is true. And that God sits at his right hand. But this is no longer a plea. This has turned into an affirmation of faith, hasn't it? And between the fear of verse 1 and the confidence of verse 8, well, what has he done? I mean, how did he come from fear to present faith? Well, he tells us in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. The pathway from nagging fear and uncertainty and the plea for help to affirmation and confidence that he is safe and secure in God has come from steeping himself in what God is for him. David has set God before him and examined him and he's looked at him and he has been able to remind himself of who God is. He has rehearsed the attributes of God. He has reaffirmed his knowledge of God, the God who oversees his life. 
And as he rehearses all these attributes of God, he comes to understand that God puts all those attributes at his disposal. And if God is with him and his attributes are at his disposal, what could he possibly have to fear? So he exalts in the statement, I have set Yahweh before me always. Archibald Hodge was writing a biography about his father, Charles Hodge, who was the great theologian at Princeton back in the 19th century. And in it he included a little section from his father's diary. And Charles Hodge had written this in his diary. As far back as I can remember, I had the habit of thanking God for everything I received and asking him for everything I wanted. If I lost a book or any of my playthings, I prayed that I might find it. I prayed walking along the streets, in school and out of school, whether playing or studying. I didn't do this in obedience to any prescribed rule. It just seemed natural. I thought of God as an everywhere present being, full of kindness and love, who would not be offended if a child talked to him. Now, maybe that was a childlike innocence. But I feel like Hodge's experience illustrates verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. I commit all things to him. I bring all things before him. It's a true desire to fellowship with God, which means that well, one never has to carry one's burden alone. You know, there are times when we must consciously remind ourselves of the things that God offers to us if only we will turn to Him in total commitment. And really, in terms of your prayer life, I would recommend David's approach to you. I mean, notice how David is aware of his need for God there in verse 1. He cries out for God to preserve him. And notice how he doesn't stop and wait for an answer there. He, he doesn't sit in silence and wait for something to fill the vacuum. No, he fills the silence with a declaration of who God is. God is his refuge, his sovereign Lord, his only treasure, his trusted counselor. And as he exalts in Yahweh, David finds his fears are fading and his confidence is rising, rising to the point he can feel God's nearness, which makes his confidence move on to an even higher level. Because God is at my right hand, he says, I shall not be shaken. You know, I'm sure that we all experience times in the Christian life when we are overcome by problems and situations and, and fears. I mean, we all know those times. But like David, we need to look away from ourselves and look to God. And what a great thought that we can share with David, that wonderful declaration he makes. I have set the Lord before me, and because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. There's a pattern here. You see, in verse 1 is the petition for God to preserve him. And that petition leads to exaltation, the rehearsal of what and who God is. And the exaltation leads to confidence. He will not be shaken, which leads then to pervasive and deep joy. It's really a journey from deep and pervasive fear to deep and pervasive joy in eight verses. So having declared the present blessing of a relationship with God, having underlined and secured his present faith, David now turns his attention to the future. But first, he's going to reveal the answer to the question, that the one that we set aside earlier. What was he seeking preservation from? What was he so afraid of in verse 1? Well, David was afraid of dying. He was afraid of being abandoned to Sheol, the land of the dead. If you look there at verses 9 and 10, he says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. In other words, you will not let me remain in the grave, in the land of the dead. Now, this really is 
an extraordinary statement because the promise of heaven had not really been revealed at this point in history. The Old Testament believers didn't really have much information on the subject of death and the afterlife. They knew that Sheol claimed the soul and that the grave claimed the body. But David appears to believe that the triumph of the tomb over the flesh and the hold of Sheol over his soul were not final. David is confident that if God is his portion, then God will be his portion in all those ways forever. And he seems to have no doubt that God will bring his body and soul through life and death into a full and everlasting pleasure because God is his sovereign refuge, his sovereign Lord, his supreme treasure, and his trusted counselor. And he's able to see this even though his looking glass at this point in time is dark and misty. But there, there is a reason why David should have, has at least has an inkling of this. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Nathan the prophet came to David and he says to him, when your days were fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. This is Nathan the prophet speaking to David for God. And he tells David, you're going to die. David knew he would join Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the grave and his body would rot. There was no question about it. God's prophet Nathan is very clear. You're going to die. But he says more though. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, you are going to die. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish his throne in the kingdom forever. So David knew that he would die and lie in the grave with his fathers and that God would set one of his descendants upon the eternal throne of God's kingdom. And this descendant would have a reign that would see no end and he would be the last king because he would rule eternally which means the eternal king would somehow triumph over death. I guess because to, rem- to reign eternally you can't die, can you? Therefore death will not end this king's eternal reign. So David lived with the knowledge that it was his fate to die and to face corruption. But then how can David say, I'm going to live forever, that he would not be abandoned to the grave? Well, David had somehow seen beyond the physical, and he is talking about his eternal soul. In fact, he's really talking about the resurrection. Somehow he knew the Messiah would bring an end to death, which meant he would see eternal joys in God's kingdom, at God's right hand, as he says. And he knew they were related, but he didn't know how because the glass was too dark. (laughs) But if there's any doubt about this, Peter in Acts 2, in his Pentecostal sermon, confirms this very thing. Peter quotes verses 8 to 11 from Psalm 16, the ones that David says here. And then he says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to David that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he would not be abandoned to Sheol nor did his flesh see corruption. That was Jesus who God raised up and that we are all witnesses to. So there it is, isn't it? David with the eye of faith in the present was able to see his hope for the future, the truth about his resurrection. David would live forever because of what the Holy One, the Lord Jesus would do God's Holy One would overcome the very gates of death. And if that was not enough, David then reaches beyond the resurrection to the rapture, which is, well, we're still waiting for the rapture today, aren't we? Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The path of life begins at the very lowest, the darkest points of Sheol, 
but then it leads up through Sheol, out through the portals of the grave, up to the heights of heaven, and up to the right hand of God. And this is the ultimate prospect of every godly man and woman. Just think about this. I mean, where is Jesus now? Well, Jesus is the right hand of God, isn't he? Where does Jesus say we're going to be? We read it earlier in John chapter 14. Well, we're going to be with him at God's right hand. Where is there future joy? Where are those pleasures forevermore? At God's right hand. And who are the saints in verse 3 that we're going to spend eternity with? Well, they are those who have made Jesus Christ their secure refuge, their sovereign Lord, their only treasure, their trusted counselor. You see, we know that those who are united in Christ are the saints. And when Christ triumphed over death, the saints, along with David, also triumphed over death. We will not be left in Sheol, but instead we will enter into the eternal pleasures at the right hand of God forevermore. So, I mean, are you one of the saints this morning? Is Jesus your secure refuge, your sovereign Lord, your only treasure, your trusted counselor? You see, I, I hope that we, the last verse of this psalm will be the victory cry of everyone here. For you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's stop and pray, I think.